we were just looking at the joyous effort section of guide to a bodhisattva's way of life and i was talking about mostly what stands in the way of having enthusiasm for practice and how to overcome that with a gentleness when we're looking at guide to a bodhisattva's way of life we have to always remember the audience and the time so this was the eighth century ish and this was a teaching given to uh, a monastic community and being a monastic community you can assume some things which is that people were there because they wanted to practice right so he was not talking to people who needed to be convinced that dharma was important he was trying to teach to people who already decided that dharma was important but were wanting to look at their own minds and go more deeply with it and i think it's also important to realize that Shantideva in his time was not particularly revered. In his time, he was looked down on. And uh, they said, you know, he had perfected the three practices, you know, eating and sleeping and going to the toilet, right? And he was a secret yogi practitioner. And when he was asked to give this teaching, the people who asked him were kind of doing it like as a lark, you know, to kind of make fun of him and say, all right, so teach this bodhicitta attitude, you know, you fool, basically, let's see what you got. And he surprised them all by just teaching this beautiful poetry, just completely from his heart and from his experience. And of course, it was so um, resonating with everyone and struck everyone so deeply. But then it was remembered, passed on in the oral tradition and eventually written down. I think it's important to realize that because this text is so popular, there's been many different translations of the same text, and they give a slightly different flavor. And you'll come across this in Buddhist um, teachings a lot where sometimes the texts we're using have been translated by scholars, sometimes by practitioners, and hopefully by scholar practitioners in a perfect world. Yeah. But sometimes if you're reading a text that's just from a scholar, it's too much hair splitting, not enough heart. And if it's just a practitioner, it's too much poetry, not enough pith you know, because they know what they mean, and we won't know what they mean without commentary. For them, it goes without saying, but for us, we need some explanation. So what we want in a perfect world are scholar, practitioner, translators, but that's not always the case. So if you're reading a traditional text like this, and you feel a little bit like, that's a weird way of putting it, don't feel like the text isn't for you. It might just be that the translator is not for you. So joyous effort or the paramita of joyous effort is translated as joyous effort, as enthusiasm, as zeal, right? Zeal, Alan Wallace, um, you know, but basically what we're talking about is energy and some people translate it as energy. And what is it energy for? It's energy for practice or delight in virtue. So whatever the translators are calling it, what we're talking about is a perfection. So what do you think distinguishes a perfection from just a good way of living or common sense or kind of laws for life or, you know, like the four agreements or something? What is a, what makes something a perfection or a paramita off the top of your head or an educated guess? What do you reckon? What makes a perfection a perfection as opposed to just, you know, joyous efforts, a good way of living in general, Buddhist or not? What would make it the perfection of joyous effort or the perfection of generosity? What's a, what is this paramita word conveying? Isn't it combined with the understanding of emptiness? In a perfect world, yes. Yes. But even before that, hmm. something else. You're quite right. Yeah, it needs an understanding of emptiness and also bodhicitta. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Look, and it seems like it's obvious, but it needs to be stated because sometimes when we say, you know, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom, these six paramitas or these six perfections, we just we can make them too ordinary and think, oh yeah, all religions believe that, all basic ethical disciplines think those are good things. Yeah, yeah, those are just good ways to live. And they are, but there's something additional to that, which is they're under the influence of bodhicitta. They're in a perfect world under the influence of uncontrived bodhicitta. And uncontrived bodhicitta together with an understanding of emptiness. 
And when we're looking at things from that perspective, then joyous effort's got a deeper meaning because the whole reason for the energy is to move you towards awakening to your fullest potential. And in that way, being of most benefit to all sentient beings. So it's not you know, enthusiasm for Habitat for Humanity, getting buildings built for homeless people, which is amazing and wonderful, but it's not this, it's not joyous effort unless it's under the influence of bodhicitta. So you could be thinking, I'm going to work for Habitat for Humanity and help build houses for people without homes. And I want to do this, you know, in a general good civic community member way. Excellent. Or you could do it with a, in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, I want to develop my practice of generosity, patience, et cetera. And the particular form it's going to take today is me hammering some nails. But the particular form it takes isn't the main point. It's the motivation driving it. Because you could just as easily do that excellent good deed with pride and think, aren't I such a good person? You know, or you could do it with now, what are you going to give me a sense of expectation? Or now you feel entitled to hang around those houses after people have been given them and think, well, I helped build it. I have a right to come anytime I want. You know, mm -hmm. like there's all sorts of mixed motivations can come in unless you're very clear about your reasons why you're doing a good thing. Yeah, it's not good from its own side. It's not good divorced from context. And so we're remembering that we are good, kind people who want to help in this world, but we need to consciously adjust our motivation to be the broadest and most expansive, even if our activities are very ordinary. Does that make sense to you or does that resonate with you? Because otherwise, even our best things come under the control of self-cherishing and self-grasping. Yeah. So all of the perfections are theoretically in each perfection. And this is um, also how we want to practice perfectly is to think, all right, if I'm practicing, say, generosity, I need the generosity of generosity. I need the patience of generosity. I need the ethics of generosity. I need the joyous effort of generosity. I need the concentration of generosity. I need the wisdom of generosity and so forth. So it's it's kind of like pro level work it's the attitudes and activities of a bodhisattva we're not a bodhisattva yet probably or we have our moments right but we're not a bodhisattva until we have uncontrived bodhicitta coloring every single thought always without effort so it means that we're going to need a lot of effort in the beginning in order to conjure that habit pattern if we're talking completely materialistic like brain neuroscience and psychology it's new neural pathways. But from a Buddhist perspective, it goes much deeper than that. And it's actually training the mind so much so that the default assumption of all of your other thoughts is in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient things. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. And I think you guys have studied things like this before quite a lot, right? Right. Yeah. So it's it's something that we just have to keep coming back to again and again. And then when we look at Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, we're hearing it from that perspective. This is a perfection. It's not just a nice way of being. So verse two of chapter seven, what is enthusiasm? <laughs> and we're calling it enthusiasm in this translation. It is enthusiasm about virtue. Its discordant classes should be explained. They are laziness, adherence to what is negative, and despising oneself out of despondency. Because of relishing the pleasurable taste of indolence and craving based on sleep, from not being disillusioned with the sufferings of cyclic existence, laziness grows very strong. Enmeshed in the snare of disturbing conceptions, you have entered the snare of birth. Why are you still not aware that you've gone into the mouth of the Lord of Death? Okay, so it's enthusiasm about virtue. It's discordant classes, right? It's discordant classes. They're saying laziness, adherence to what is negative and despising oneself out of despondency. But you can call all three of those different forms of laziness. So here's a, here's a simpler way of talking about it. And this is what we talked about last time, but just to keep it fresh, we could say this is the laziness of procrastination avoidance and or busyness. 
So putting off or avoiding big positive actions and or being busy with lesser actions that look productive but avoid depth. Then we have laziness of attachment to other activities, sometimes called ignoble activities. So this is entertainment and comfort orientation and fixation. So maybe valuing spiritual practice and or beneficial work, but valuing and pursuing mundane and worldly activities more. And then this third one, this laziness of despondency or self-contempt or loss of heart, is thinking that spiritual practice is only for special people, not us. Forgetting our Buddha potential and deciding to stay ordinary and not develop our path. So it's a false humility or a false modesty. So we call all three of these laziness, which is such a triggering kind of pejorative term in English. But what we're really talking about are things that take away the fuel or things that ruin the momentum, or things that kind of put a log jam in the whole situation. So don't think of it as, oh, I am this one. Think I do this one. Right. And so just like take a minute and look at those three and ask yourself on a tired day, on a grumpy day, on a needy attached day, on a day when you don't want to do anything, what's your style of laziness? <laughs> what's the style? <clears throat> Are you more likely to just sort of avoid and put off or run towards distraction or look down on yourself? Yeah, and whether you share or not, make sure you share with your own self. Mm -hmm. um, the one that we talk about a lot is the first one, this, um, this laziness of what we may be called just procrastination, but you can be very, very busy and very, very productive, but it's actually a form of avoidance. And this one is such a dangerous trap because we have such a sense of our value and worth being tied up with productivity. Yeah. yeah. And so to say to yourself, actually, it supports joyous effort to rest. <laughs> it's a little bit triggering, right? Like if you don't want to do the positive action, it might be that you're tired. Don't talk over the top of yourself and say, well, be busy doing something. Busy, 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 busy. Now I'm good. Yeah. It's so hard because of, you know, late stage capitalism, et cetera, right? But okay. when we're really looking at things that give us energy, we have to look very strategically at how a quiet, simple continuity, a pace that we can maintain, is the healthy way to practice, rather than a spike and a drop, and a spike and a drop. I remember once asking my teacher, you know, how soon should it be till I do like a three-year retreat or a Vajrasattva retreat or one of these big retreats? When should I do that? And he said, how about you do this one tiny practice every day forever? <laughs> And, I was like, All right. and then, and then, you know, a few years later, I'm like, I think I'm ready for this big retreat or that big retreat. And he was like, yeah, okay, do it if you want to, but also add this other small practice every single day forever <laughs> and add this small practice every single day forever and gradually build your practice and your practice becomes your life. And what is retreat or in, in retreat or out of retreat becomes a lot more ambiguous because you're doing sessions every day. And then you're coming out of sessions and you're living your life, you're having interactions. And it does help to have structured time when you're away from the hustle and bustle. It is useful to do retreat, absolutely. But to not think of that as that's the time I'm accomplishing and the rest of the time I'm not. It should be a place of like tidying and intensifying and deepening so that then your daily practice has more strength and momentum. Yeah, so just very small practice every day. It, it can be a little bit hard on our pride also because on a really good day with all the conditions complete, maybe we can sit like a champion. You know, we can sit for two hours, three hours, four hours. We can do a big sit on a good day. And then on a bad day, we'll say, well, I can't do four hours, so I won't do anything, yeah. <laughs> you know? And we get that like, paralysis of overwhelm because there's so many things we could be doing we overwhelm ourselves and don't do anything at all mm -hmm. and what if you just did like a very short motivation that took 30 seconds refuge in bodhicitta prayer sat with it let it touch your heart 
And then did shamata shine, single pointed focus on the breath for five minutes and dedicate it. I'm like, it's so small that you're almost embarrassed. The practice took less than 10 minutes. But what if you did that every single day or twice a day? Like, amazing. It would create such a wonderful new way of being and a way to touch base and reconnect with yourself. But if someone was to say to you, what is your Buddhist practice or what is your meditation practice? Your pride is like, oh, I don't want to say it's only 10 minutes. I want to say what it is on the best day with the best of conditions and identify as that while secretly feeling embarrassed that it's not really that very often. You know, so taking the performance aspect out also it's all related to pride. This despondency, this laziness of despondency is what happens if your pride tries to perform many times and fails, then you go to the other extreme and you say, well, obviously practice is for special people. I'm not special, so I have permission not to practice and I'm just being modest and humble and aware of my particular state right now. I'll leave that to the special fancy people. <laughs> right. And, you, and it, you know, it's what happens when your performance pride fails enough times, you sink down into some sort of despondency, depression, looking down on yourself. Whereas if you actually saw the skills and abilities you have as you are on an ordinary day and kind of like more identified there in a relative sense, you wouldn't be so disappointed all the time. You know, and that place was always fine. It's just your pride had inflated who you think you are. So of course you're disappointing yourself constantly by not meeting yourself there. So it's 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 tricky because it will kill the joy of your practice and it will kill your momentum if part of you is performing your practice. Yeah, with the background thought of what will I tell the Buddhist people in my life about my practice? It's like, actually, just keep it to yourself. It's your own business. <laughs> they will see your practice reflected in your behavior. You know, they'll see it reflected in your heart. And if you're not becoming just a little bit more gentle, a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more kind, and also sharper and clearer as the result of your practice, it might be that you're squeezing too hard. Yeah. Or it might be that you're having some sort of approach issue to your practice. Because there's your practice and then there's your approach to your practice. The mentality you bring to your practice. And the baggage from, you know, your life up until now, which might be like, well, now that I'm a good Buddhist, a good girl does this. And you're sort of scolding yourself onto your cushion or something. <laughs> right? that, can, you, that can happen. And that's never been the point. You know, so all of these things are the thief of joy. What you want is to think, I love doing this. And sometimes it's a little bit hard because my distractions get in the way. You know, I love doing this, but it's hard because I don't have a lot of renunciation yet. You know, it's like, what makes it hard are your afflictions. There's nothing wrong with you. Oh, yeah. You know, you're fine. You have Buddha nature. Your mind is clarity and awareness. It is transformable. Nothing wrong with you. Tons of afflictions, we all have them, you know? So when there's interference to your practice, place the blame where the blame actually exists. It's just, oh, right, afflictions. Of course, I don't want to do this because my deep heart wants to, but my surface habits are very strong. And they say, look, you could sit for 10 minutes or you could scroll for 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> or you could listen to music for 10 minutes or you could vague out for 10 minutes. And the lack of renunciation says, oh, it's just today. What does it matter? What does it matter if, if today you make the wrong choice? It's only today. And then the todays stack up and your life races by. And so that's why in the text, one of the antidotes is to remember death. You know, and that young people die before old people every single day and healthy people die before sick people every single day. The idea that we'll, you know, get it all together at the last minute is kind of not possible. You can't suddenly inject peace and insight at the last minute. You know, so it's got to be practices that we're developing now. And remembering that practice isn't always meditation. There's the wisdom of hearing and there's the wisdom of contemplating, which are just as significant as the wisdom of meditation. And your wisdom of meditation is not going to have the same power 
if you haven't thought about it a lot before you got to the cushion or heard and read and studied a lot before you had to think. So, you know, so just kind of like building into your life of everything can be practiced if I make it so. If I want my practice to be deeper, but I'm not sure what to do, again, that's no deficiency. It means I just have to study more. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. There was one nun at the nunnery where I did my training, um, and that was in Australia, so they were all very Australian. And <laughs> she was a very senior nun who wound up being the attendant of our teacher, which means she was so busy with logistics, she couldn't study very often. And, you know, so because she's always arranging things and errands and logistics and where is he going now and where is he going then? And, you know, she was a very smart woman and could have studied very well, but she chose to give her life to this type of service. So sometimes new students would ask her like a big, deep philosophical question, assuming that she would know because she was such a senior nun. And she would just say with no shame, no pride, no defensiveness, she would just say, oh, yeah, I don't know that. I haven't studied it. <laughs> like no shame you know like and they're like but you've been ordained for 40 years and she's like yeah I haven't studied that <laughs> you know why would I know I haven't studied it you know and it was just so refreshing to see her lack of shame and embarrassment about it it was like I would know it if I studied it but I haven't so I don't <laughs> you know and it sort of takes the sting out yeah of feeling like you have to be the expert because you've been around for a while it's like we're the expert of a million different things, miscellaneous, random things that really we could help society with, but not necessarily everyone knows that. Yeah. You know, you might have just an amazing precision with a certain kind of meal or a certain kind of like renovation activity or a certain kind of whatever. And these are beautiful offerings to sentient beings. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is tweak it by adding some bodhicitta motivation. Now it's practice. Yeah. Yeah, so joyous effort helps you remember that you're already getting the job done quite well. Yeah, every time you feed your pets, every time you're kind to your neighbors, every time you water your garden can be practice if you make it so. Or it can be a chore and a checklist if you make it so. So it's your choice, you know, is it a chore or is it practice? It changes day to day but it's the inner mentalities. So I just thought that we'd like scooch over and look at a different translation of the same verses, just to tell you, show you a little bit more of what I was talking about. This is the Alan Wallace translation. He says, thus one who has patience should cultivate zeal because awakening is established with zeal. And there is no merit without zeal, just as there is no movement without wind. What is zeal? It is enthusiasm for virtue. What is said to be its antithesis is spiritual sloth, clinging to the reprehensible, apathy, wow. and self-contempt. So these are different uh, translations for those laziness. Spiritual sloth, <laughs> clinging yeah. to the reprehensible, apathy, and self-contempt. Yeah. It's very interesting, and it conveys something slightly different than the other translation, even though it's the same verse. Yeah. So kind of whatever gets you into connecting with the essence of it, where you can see what is it that I do? What is it I do that's blocking my joy and my momentum? Okay. So um, I thought we'd just do a little meditation on that. Is, is that all right? A little shorty meditation? Okay, and then we'll have a stretch and then we'll shift on to um, a different part. So just have a straight back. And if you're in a chair, I think we're all in chairs, <laughs> try not to rely on the back of your chair. And if you need to scooch forward or scooch back, do whatever scooching you need to do so that it's easy to be straight upright. And a few deep intentional breaths to ground yourself. It can help to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth a few times, intentionally deep.
And then just let yourself breathe naturally, but watch the breath as your focal object or your object of meditation. Let your focus ride the breath the way a surfer might ride a wave, relaxed but attentive. And then internally revive your motivation, connecting with refuge, connecting with bodhicitta, letting it resonate. And then shift to analysis and very gently and kindly explore your own obstacles to practice. When your mind wants to go in a positive direction, whether service or study or contemplation or meditation, something under the heading of spiritual practice, when you want to, but you don't, what is the don't about? Is it more likely to be procrastination, putting off? Is it more likely to be attachment to distractions? Or is it more likely to be despondency, looking down on yourself? When you want to, but don't, why not? What do you say to yourself? When I want to do spiritual practice, but then I get diverted into something else, what kind of things divert my attention? What do I do instead? If our forms of laziness had a particular obvious affliction carried with it, 
Would it be that our laziness or our distractions are usually about attachment? Craving, seeking, neediness. We want to do spiritual practice, but we're more attracted to comforts. Or is it more like we have aversion? We want to do spiritual practice, but we have some fear of what we'll find if we actually start. Or we're worried about the effort it will take. Or maybe it's even a simple thing that our body doesn't like to sit that way because it's not used to it. Or we have some physical ailment making things uncomfortable to sit still. So just checking in is aversion sometimes the reason that you don't do spiritual practice, even when you want to. And maybe sometimes it's attachment, craving for comfort. Sometimes it's aversion, not wanting to. Maybe sometimes it's ignorance. We want to do spiritual practice. And then we just kind of vague out or space out or drift away and the day gets away from us. We meant to, but then we got distracted. So maybe our laziness is one of these most often and the rest of them sometimes. Maybe they just rotate and take turns. But just think now on a good day when you've gotten to your seat, what helped you shift out of the afflicted response? What helped you challenge the habit? When you've been motivated, what helped to motivate you? And it's okay to hold open the question and not be sure of the answer, but be curious. And think all of the energy I put into these thoughts, may it go towards overcoming laziness, developing the perfection of joyous effort in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay, so you can relax your attention. And we'll have a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and do more. So see you in 10 minutes. So in that meditation, were you able to Think of some things that are habitually stuck things, kind of, yeah. What about the days that you are motivated? What are the things that motivate you? Were there some 
some things that came up or was that kind of a bit more amorphous when you do do it why <laughs> what motivates you is there like some urgency that comes because of like the pressing need of an event or a person is something presses you or suddenly space opens up in a certain way or if anyone feels comfortable sharing what does motivate you on a good day it's easier to say what it doesn't motivate me yeah definitely yeah <laughs> I find that fatigue as I age yeah and I think other and the other thing is setting a specific time and um so that I say, oh, well, I have to make an appointment for a doctor. I have to make it this, or I have to that. There's always something that comes up. But if it's said, no, that's not, that's not the time. I've got that, something else. I mean, it, it tends to fill in the gaps rather than be the primary thing when it's a negative. And I think that's how it's so easy to overlook it if it isn't the considered a primary thing that's to be done at a specific time and place. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what makes us brush our teeth? You know, like yeah. initially, initially our parents made us. <laughs> Eventually yeah. we did it on our own. Some days we really enjoy it. Some days it's a total hassle, but we do it because we yeah. want to stay in our head, you know, and they're useful things to have, you know? So it's like, some days you don't feel like it with practice and you know, you'll feel better afterwards. And yeah. it's hard to reconcile that with the like hustle and bustle of everyday life and the things that capture your attention it's so natural to be like sure I could do that but I actually have these pressing things that have to be done today you know and it's like how to carve into your day a time that really is sacred for practice and that you have enough will you know will driven by all sorts of background thoughts and study where you can do it on days you feel like it and days you don't because you know that you'll feel better afterwards and that you'll be kinder for sentient beings afterwards. It's, it's, I don't mean to take up more time, no, but no, no. The, the, um, the thing is that sometimes it feels like it isn't as, I'm not as participating at the same level all the time. Yeah. And I don't know, I know, I, I think of the nuns and practicing and, and that you're like yourself and others that I feel like it's, it's, it's a habit and it's a, it's a group of people and it's really easy with others. But sometimes I feel like, okay, I just did it, but did I just say the words? And I can actually find myself saying words to some sadhana or something and I don't even remember saying them. Yeah. Yeah. They're just, and but I've said every word and I think, you know, okay, start over again. <laughs> and that's what I do. But it's like, it's hard sometimes for me to keep the motivation and keep the intent and not just be sitting there. Absolutely. Yeah. And going through the motions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's not a, a none, not none thing. You know, we, we do have better conditions just because we have less distractions you know, but sometimes that less distractions is a pressure, you know, because you have fewer excuses, you can't let yourself off the hook and your attachment is the same as anyone else's. As in you're like, oh, maybe one more cup of tea, one more cup of tea, and then I'll do my, you know, <laughs> oh, maybe really? I'm just going to empty the dishwasher and then I'll, you know, and it, like, it's really easy to justify not. And if you've consciously made your life more simple and you have fewer pressures in everyday life, it doesn't necessarily mean it's easier to get to the cushion. You just have fewer excuses, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and then it's more embarrassing because you're like, wow, I really, that is all I could do right now today is do my practice and maybe I'll wash the windows, which have been say sitting unwashed for the whole year, but now's the day, now's the day to wash the windows. You know, like it's, you can always find something to distract yourself with. Part of what happens to us is we are looking for too much magic too often and kind of basing our success on days of connection. And there is, there is a benefit in just going through the motions, as long as it's not going through the motions in a pressured way, where you feel like I have to in order to check this box and be good. You know, it, it's really asking yourself, 
how do you feel afterwards on an easy session and a not easy session sometimes equally you feel much better afterwards more yeah. you know more grounded more connected but it's also okay to make your practice shorter and pithier and deeper you know it's there's again there's like what you can do on a big spacious day where you have a lot of energy and a lot of space around you and then sometimes we make our plan for practice based on a good day and we should make our plan for practice how we are on a really bad day because on a really bad day that baseline you can continue the continuity every day but if you're sort of like aiming up here you're not at your best often like none of us are at our best often that's why it's called our best you know so mm. i often think like when I have a migraine, when my digestive system is grumpy, when I've been commuting too much back and forth from Corbett to Portland, when I, when I'm really, you know, not feeling up to scratch, and I haven't been eating properly, and you know, not enough green vegetables in my life, all the things, <laughs> whatever, the bad day, what's something small I can do that's real? And it might be, I have to do my same practice standing up, or I have to do the short version, or I have to be like all snuggled in my favorite blankies and then and then do my practice. But it's like, I kind of take as the baseline a bad day, not a good day. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And then on a good day, if you want to do more, you can, but you don't feel like that's the practice I have to do. The practice you have to do because you want to is that baseline on a hard day. Because none of us are getting any younger, right? Like it is going to get harder and harder. But what are some just very simple go-to thoughts or go-to mantras? You know, like when you're stressed in traffic or when it's a hard conversation, if it's just om mani peme hum in the back of your mind that reconnects you to your heart, if that's familiar, that'll be the thought you have at the time of death. If at the time of death, you're thinking, what are, oh, I should think this, or I should think that, or I should think this, or I should think that. Will your mind be peaceful and ripen positive seeds for a positive rebirth? You know, so it's like, start with what's a couple tiny thoughts in the back of your mind that resonate with your heart, that are your go-to walking around practice. Everything else is a bonus and is wonderful. Do it when you feel like it. But like the inner conversation practice that is peppered throughout the day is so significant even if it's one phrase from lo jung or one mantra that you love or just a word you know that's your go-to thank yeah. you yeah yeah jordan go ahead um some of the things that have really helped my practice um over the years are remembering the benefits of practice, you know, that if I want to develop my mind, I have to work at it just like anything else. Um, and um, yeah, and to um, uh, there, were, there were a couple other just kind of basic things. I mean, but kind of relating to the discussion you just had about i mean it, balance was just one of the themes of of what you talked about just just now of of um you know the difference between our you know our finding our baseline at least being able to do that on a bad day um <clears throat> kind of relating to that is uh learning not to be self-critical and judge my practice in terms of i mean you have to have some assessment of your practice so you can't just say i'm not going to judge my practice but not to judge your practice of like oh i'm a bad practitioner you know so um so you just do your best and and but make sure you're doing something you know every day uh yeah well and, and the thing is is like the the chapter starts with here's what not to do, do and why it's problematic and it's a little bit like how the four noble truths starts with suffering it's like let's talk about the hard thing that is true right now to make it come into awareness so that you ask yourself 
what's the next step and then it goes on to say here are the things to do here are the things to think there are three types of laziness but as it turns out there are four types of um powers and there are three types of joyous effort there's way more strategies than there are problems <laughs> so there's bound to be one that's going to resonate for you so i think you know what happens is that you need to be a little bit confronted by the truth of the hard thing like suffering exists like laziness exists like we already knew before the Buddha told us, before Shantideva told us, we already knew, but by bringing it up into awareness, it gives you a little bit of that confronting feeling of, oh, right, yeah, and also death is coming. What habits do I want to carry with me to my future life? Do I want to just keep having life after life of distraction? Or do I want life after life of gently, joyfully working on my mind and developing it without that sense of, I'm only a good person if I do so. Harshness, we don't want that, <laughs> right? You know, so, so if we're looking at the text again, Shantideva says, without despondency, I should gather the masses of army and diligently take control of myself through equalizing self with others and exchanging self for others. I should not be despondent thinking, how can I ever attain enlightenment? Thus the Tathagatas who speak what is true have uttered this truth. If they develop the strength of exertion, even those who are flies, mosquitoes, bees, and likewise worms will win the unsurpassable enlightenment which is hard to attain. Since I have been born human by race and recognize what is beneficial and what is harmful, if I do not forsake the deeds of enlightenment, why will I not attain enlightenment? So it's basically saying like little tiny insects have Buddha nature that they cannot ruin. You're actually a human being. You know what's positive and what's negative. You're already ahead of the game. <laughs> like, thank goodness. But like, if even they are not a lost cause, of course you're not a lost You know, it's sort of giving you a little bit of a boost to like shake off that despondency monster. And then when you look at supports for joyous effort, they're called the four forces or the four powers, depending on the translator. And these are all from the Lama Rin Chenmo um, from uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment. So the first is the power of aspiration. So you're remembering the benefits of spiritual path and positive work. So just like what Jordan was saying, you're remembering the benefits. Remembering the benefits, though, has to be done delicately so it doesn't feel like pressure. Yeah? So how do you remember the benefits of spiritual practice without putting a pressure on yourself that makes you rebel or feel like a failure? So you're just kind of sitting with, what is it to live in aspiration and let aspiration turn into inspiration? Which sounds very trite and, you know, like play on words, but there is something to it of what creates an aspiring mind? Sometimes it's reading biographies and historical accounts of other practitioners. Sometimes it's meeting people a few steps ahead of you, seemingly, at least in practice, and being inspired by that. But sometimes it's as simple as looking at your own past, your own past of your own life, and think, 10 years ago, I was grumpier. <laughs> Or 10 years ago, I was less patient. Like that was born through effort and continuity of saying to myself again and again, anger does not help. Yeah. And I still get grumpy sometimes and I still get impatient sometimes and annoyed sometimes like everybody else, but it is a lot better than 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And you're really letting your own memory give you buoyancy. And occasionally what will happen is looking in your memory, you might think, actually, I was a little better at this and this and this a few years ago, and I've backslid a little bit, because a lot of us have had a bit of a backslide, like during COVID, for example, you know, where we were actually doing quite well, and then all of the hardships kind of interrupted things, and then we kind of did a bit of a backslide, but rather than letting that information dishearten us to think, I was in that place, that means it's an achievable place for me. I, you know, and it's just going to be a little bit of step by step building myself back up to that, but it won't take as long as the first time because I've already done it once. Yeah. 
so kind of giving yourself aspiration while not putting pressure on yourself, it's kind of like you say, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> and then you want to. Yeah, it's a little bit of like, you know, reverse psychology. But if you say to yourself, what if I am okay as I am, if I never get any better, I am still worthy, I am still of benefit. If I never change, you will, but say you never change, you're still worthy. You know, you're still a value to society, to your friends and family. You're still a good person. You know, like start with the baseline of, I'm actually fine. <laughs> Anything from here is a bonus. So you're soothing a little bit on one side. And then on the other side, you say, and also very gently, I need to wake myself up with the awareness that my mind left to its own devices won't naturally get better. Some effort needs to be applied. And if I were to waste the potential of being a human being, that would be a shame. You know, it would be a shame. Like, why would it be a shame? I'm fine as I am. I'm happy enough, content enough. It would be a shame because the people I have strong karmic connection with wouldn't get as deep a benefit from me. My radius of impact will stay as it is. It won't get any bigger. And the people in my life who I do have impact on, it will only be as it is right now. It won't be a deeper impact. It won't be as significant an impact as it could be. And there are so many people in my life right now who I wish I could help more. And I can't because I don't have the skills. Yes, also they haven't created the cause, but you know, if I had more depth, I might have more impact. I would be a more powerful condition. So you do just on one side, like you're fine as you are. Don't worry about it. You're fine. Also, <laughs> also you don't want to waste the human potential. And so it gives you like a type of longing to develop that then becomes like a joyful thing. It's a little bit like if you love art and there's some sort of art form that you're good at, whether it's like quilting or painting or knitting or whatever it is, there is effort involved, but there's a type of joy in the satisfaction that will come when it's finished. So there's effort, but there's a joyful effort. It's not joyous effort in the perfection sense, but it's the type of effort that you're like looking forward to the next step and you're looking forward to the unfolding and you're looking forward to the finished product and who you'll give it to and how much they'll enjoy it. You know, like we could all get like, I don't know, a cheap blanket from Ikea, but if someone made you a quilt, it would just, oh, it would touch your heart so much and it would be one of your precious things, not because of the blanket itself, but because of the love that went into it, you know? And so using everyday examples like that to kind of give you buoyancy in your aspiration, which doesn't mean you have to do anything yet. You're building, yeah, some sort of critical mass, some sort of like battery that then when you actually start, you're going to have more oomph. So the things that make you have aspiration and inspiration are really important. Um, sometimes it's as simple as just going to more teachings and listening deeply and knowing that that is practice. Yeah, the next steps are also practice, but the going and the showing up and the not giving up is practice. You know, like in the, in the car, I listened to Universe in a Single Atom by His Holiness recited by Richard Gere, just kind of again and again. Yeah, keeps me focused if I'm bored in traffic, you know, and it's like, it's something that I already know. It's something that I've read before. It's none of it is news, but it brings me back to myself so that in the traffic, I don't lose my path. And when I get home, I'm going to have a little bit more fortitude to not just collapse in a heap, you know, and if I do, I do, it's no big deal, right? But it's somehow looking at how aspiration lives with you is really important piece. Yeah. <clears throat> so steadfastness, sometimes translated as firmness or positive pride or confidence. In the long run, it says never turning back from working for the welfare of others, recalling their needs, as well as your current ability and potential. So steadfastness is confidence, basically. 
And we know that pride is an affliction because it's looking down on others, right? But confidence is recognizing you have Buddha nature. It's also recognizing you do know some stuff already. And that the things that you know and the things that you are are already useful and already needed. Sometimes what kills our energy is not feeling needed and not feeling useful. If you're not feeling needed or useful, you just haven't met the right group of people. There are people who need exactly what you have to offer. Um, but often what sort of pulls you into more momentum in practice is the need of others. So if that's not obvious to you how others need you, let's cast the net more widely. Who needs what you have to offer? There's any number of charitable organizations and volunteer work you could be doing, but there's also any number of friends and family and neighbors who actually could use what you have to offer as well. It's, it's being really clear about so far in your life, conditions have supported what skill set? And it can be the most mundane of skill sets. You know, it could be something really like seemingly boring, like how to clean off burnt milk from the bottom of a pan. <laughs> right? You know, like hmm, vinegar and baking soda. I don't know. Maybe also, you know, like, you know, some stuff about stuff and it seems so boring because you take it for granted, but it is known by you and it was born through effort. Value it and know that there is a need for that. So if you're not seeing where people need you, cast the net more widely or look more clearly at the people in your life and what they seem to be needing and asking for. You know, sometimes with my relatives, what I realize when I visit home is that they don't need any of my Buddhism whatsoever, but they do need time, energy, connection. So how do I convey connection in a way that is gonna feel resonant for them. So it might be talking about the weather. It might be talking about the horses. It might be talking about the roads. It might be something very mundane because what they need is connection. And then when they feel connection, the best of them comes forward. So like learning to listen more deeply for what people are kind of telling you that they need even without words, then you're starting to see the way that you're of benefit to others directly as well as expansively. It's hard because there's so much advice about work for the welfare of all sentient beings, become enlightened for the welfare of all sentient beings, and that feels distant. Enlightenment is distant, all sentient beings are distant. But there are sentient beings in your immediate life who have immediate need. So use the fact of that. Yeah, and really think of them like the specific individuals as representatives of all sentient beings. You know, like that neighbor across the street who lives all alone and looks so isolated and seems to be a hoarder because I can't even see through their windows. It's all filled up with newspapers and, you know, there's cars all over the yard and it looks like they are struggling. And I am not sure what to do for a person like this that would be respectful, that would be kind. I'm gonna use them to get me to my cushion and maybe with the clarity that comes from my cushion, I'll be more creative about how to help them. But even if I'm not, there's a depth that's been connected to, which is gonna come in handy. So it's not like you have to wait till enlightenment to be of any use. You're of use all the way along. It just gets deeper and more expansive. How, how is that landing? Are you feeling any ideas or resistance so far, those two? aspiration and steadfastness. Some of it's stating the obvious, but sometimes it needs to be stated, yeah. <laughs> I really resonated with, uh, you know, connecting to Buddha nature and just, you know, remembering the benefits of practice, which is sort of related to Buddha nature, the ability to improve ourselves and just um, realize, well, if I keep going, um, there's no limit to what we can achieve, what I can achieve uh, based on being steadfast in my practice. Um, and just, you know, remembering, uh, remembering teachers that have been around, you know, and just being inspired by them. And, and one of them 
Jada Rinpoche once said to me, you know, it doesn't matter if this was, I mean, I know sometimes I've heard this advice saying, oh, you know, we need to, we need to go to enlightenment really quickly. We need to get there as fast as we can. He sort of said, it doesn't matter how long it takes, as long as you're headed in the right direction, just keep going, you know, and, and uh, I always remember that, you know, just, just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Exactly. And to know that like the, the plateau years are still beneficial years, you know, like when you first meet the Dharma, there's usually a bit of a spike of like knowledge and practice, and then you kind of dip or plateau for a bit. And then there's another little spike and then another plateau, you know, and it kind of goes like that. And we forget that during the like kind of holding steady or like a little bit wobbly times, that the knowing and the self-awareness that you develop during those times is still quite useful. That if there is self-awareness, then you're not losing the lesson of anything. Yeah, when you have disassociated from your life and from your mind, that's when you get kind of lost years. Yeah, when you're just kind of off with the fairies. But even if you're not doing structured practice, whatever we want to call that, if your self-awareness and your mindfulness of what are you doing, why are you doing it, and what are your baseline core values, then you're still, you know, getting the job done, actually. And the mindfulness is not passive mindfulness, right? It's the mindfulness with an agenda. Am I staying in alignment with the ethics of non-harmfulness? Am I staying in alignment with the ethics of non-harmfulness. And if not, then you just bump back in. <laughs> and if so, you go hooray. And it's no big deal. It's just quiet background watching. But it's not passive mindfulness that's like, I am walking, I am walking, I am going to the bathroom, I am going shopping. It's like, with what <laughs> agenda? <laughs> with what motivation? You know, you're sort of like firing up the, in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. If that's too much, how about to not hurt anyone? <laughs> <laughs> you know, to help people have a positive experience after having left me or me having left them, you know, and then you have those beautiful days, like when you connect with the cashier at the grocery store, you're not, you know, impatient and fed up with them for not understanding the computer system or taking too long to scan or not filling up your bags the right way. Or, you know, suddenly you're like, all right, they're 17. Of course, they don't know how to load a bag properly. And then you're like, but when I was 17, I knew how to load a bag properly. You know, you're not doing all of that kind of stuff that kills the joy of you could be having a human connection with the dear old cashier. We think, oh, it's a chore. Come on, let's go. Let's go. So that I can get back to my life. It's like, well, no, but that is your life. That moment is your life right there. You know, those little things. And, you know, you have all have a lot of experience of watching what you say to yourself and watching how you are and you're just wanting to make sure it's a kind gaze that you're nice to yourself as you watch yourself and also that you're nudging yourself back into alignment with ethics and that those are good that is an amazing continuity to have that if every human being just had that as their practice we would have a very nice earth you know just try and be kind, try not to hurt anyone, be a little bit focused to your life. Huge, you know? So we might take it for granted that of course you do that, but actually that's huge, yeah? And days that you remember to is huge. Um, the next one is this power of joy, which is happy in the beginning, happy in the middle, happy at the end of positive activity, the way children are playing, even tiring sports. So it's like thinking about how little kids are when they're running around playing tag. They are like giggling and like joyful and squeaking and making all the kid noises. But they're like all red in the face and sweaty and like gross and putting in so much effort when they run around playing tag. Right. You can picture a bunch of kids playing tag. They are putting in a lot of effort, but they don't care because it's fun. Yeah. So what we're wanting is this idea of the beginning of practice is fun, the middle of practice is fun, the end of practice is fun. Fun in this like joyful, playful way. And when you think of teachers that inspire us, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he's like this close to laughing pretty much all the time. Yeah, except for when he actually is laughing. But like 
pretty much all the time. The highest philosophical concept, the most accessible public talk, everything in between. He's like this close to giggling pretty much at all times. Yeah. He's loving his job <laughs> and he works so hard. There is there's one time when he was visiting Australia where I was helping with the tour. And so I was with him with his schedule like the whole month. So he'd give these two hour public talks and then he'd do a, a TV interview and then he'd have an interview with the Tibetan community and then he'd do his prayers and then he'd be shuffled off here and shuffled off there. And there was just constant movement. I was like in my twenties then, I should have been fine. I was exhausted. He was like in his seventies then and totally fine. You know, and it was because every moment was play and he was present in every moment as play. So then he doesn't have to do that like recovery thing that we need to do. We have to recover because the moment was too much or not enough. Yeah, it's too much or not enough. So now I have to recover from it. For him, it's, it's always enough. Yeah, so that, that joyful, playful, like a little kid, curious, no expectations. That's one. And then the last one, I think, is the most profound for Westerners, which is the power of relinquishment, moderation, or rest, which is preventing burnout and illness by noticing when you're tired and deciding to rest before you've burned out so that you can continue positive actions later once you're rested. So in the Lamrim Chenmo, the quote is, if you're tired, rest. <laughs> That's the sentence, if you're tired, rest. For us, we only rest when we feel like we have permission to rest or we're like annoyed and giving up. Yeah, like we feel like we need to earn the right to rest by being totally exhausted. I've earned the right to rest because I'm totally exhausted or I've earned the right to rest because I've done so many tasks this day. I've earned it, right? Like it's so, oh my gosh, Westerners, right? What if um, you rested before you were exhausted and then you don't have to like start from scratch each time? Yeah, if you rest before you're exhausted, then you can pick up where you left off, whatever it was, pick up where you left off. If you wait until you're totally exhausted and burnt out, then the like restarting process is a lot more clunky and exhausting. So this isn't the way we were brought up to believe, you know, we were brought up to believe you're only allowed to rest if you're sick or exhausted. Yeah. And then also told, but you should get eight hours of sleep or you're bad. <laughs> Somehow we get both messages, right? And it's like, you know, you can have a siesta right in the middle of the day if you want, <laughs> anytime, <laughs> right? Like we could have a nana nap, it's fine, right? You could also just have a break, sit in a rocking chair, stare at the sky, have a cup of tea have a cup of coffee, pet the cat, like, but do it without apology. Do it as a strategy of have I rested enough to joyfully return to my practice? Not have I practiced enough to deserve rest? That's kind of how we think though. Have I practiced enough? Have I worked hard enough to deserve rest? You have to think of it the other way. Have I rested enough to have space for practice? How does that land? Does that trigger you? Make you happy? Sound obvious? <laughs> How does that land? Have I rested? I, I take a nap 75% of every day, 75% of my days. You know, every, How's in, the that? Middle of, <laughs> in the middle of the day. Yeah. I mean, it's, I can't function well if I don't rest. Mm -hmm. Jane, you've been waiting to say something, I think, haven't you? Or? Well, I don't what I I'm just listening to her and it's just like um I don't know how much I want to say. As I get older and I am older and I'm old and um I get more tired. Yeah. And um it it I can't figure out if I'm supposed to be tired or if it's something that I should be treating, you know, that I'm doing something or I'm not well or something. I do, like Jordan said, I take naps off. Like I, yesterday I went to a memorial and I took a lot longer than I had thought. And I had to walk a long way to get there. And I had to come home and sleep. There's just no question that I couldn't function. So I just came home and went to sleep. 
And I have done that and do that late afternoons often, frequently now that I'm, as I've gotten older and I'm retired. So I don't know how I got through the days before. I used to work really long days. I came home and took care of my family and everything. I don't know how I did it. I really don't know how I did it because I couldn't do it today. Yeah. Um, but it does make me think, so I do, I don't know if I dare say this, but sometimes I'm so tired. I lay down in my bed and I actually say, my prayers, I say refuge, I do a number of things. Why first lay down? Because and I don't feel like I can sit up and practice right then and there. So I do it as, as I lay down and um gives me a lot of peace before sleeping, but I don't know if that's appropriate. I sometimes okay. feel guilty. Yeah, no, and I mean the, the feel guilty part is our our socialization, right? Like any practice is good practice. <laughs> Like, you know, and like, there's a difference between I'm laying down because I can't be bothered and I'm laying down because my body's tired, Yeah, you know, and, yeah, there's a difference. and if you're dying, if, if you're dying, if you're sleeping, if you're whatevering with a positive mind, it's wonderful. And yeah. going to sleep with a positive mind is Dharma practice. It's, it's one of the recommendations. And then you're not wasting the sleep at all. <laughs> right? Like it's informed by refuge. So, you know, really like don't feel at all apologetic or guilty or anything. Like that's exactly what you should be doing. I'm about to take a nap. Let me remember refuge in Bodhicitta and a couple of mantras and, you know, exactly. This yeah, it's and I, exactly. I, I, that's separate from practice. It's not like practice, but it's just like what I do every time I, most days when I lay down or, or I go to bed at night, I do that. And I, I would say I it is felt like, am I inappropriate doing? I mean, is am I disrespectful about it? You know, no, and it is practice. It is practice. Okay. And it's excellent right. practice, actually, because you have the habit of before you shift from coarse consciousness to subtle consciousness, you're motivating with something positive. That is perfect. That's what we oh, all should be doing. Okay, good. Thank because you. it also it will build a habit that, like, you know, if you get hit by a bus, you'll also remember to do that because you're doing that all the time anyway. All right. Yeah. It's it's oh, hit by a bus. I'll do that. That's great. I just wondered about how you would ever, if you did get injured seriously, how you remember to say the right things in order to propel yourself to the right position. What were you going to say, Jim? Yeah. Oh yeah, Julie, go ahead. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah, just this idea of resting enough to be able to help is really useful to me because. I definitely come from a, a background of uh, a farm sort of background and and the message was, um, you know, uh, when you think you've done enough, you've done half enough. And, and I will I will actually see it as a virtue to, you know, press and press and press. And yet I'm in a situation right now with uh, um, someone with a really uh, was injured and harmed and um, and needs a lot of a lot of attention. It, my husband actually, and you know, uh, needs to go to appointments. Needs and and I have and I recognize that this is not beneficial. This attitude of pushing, 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 because um, what's happened is I have become less helpful and and more critical. And so this is really definitely what I needed to be reminded. <laughs> uh, we have this like inner critic all the time saying oh it's not gosh. enough, it's not enough. And then it ruins the good that you are doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you That's start right. to present yeah. the very good thing that you're doing, you know? And it's yeah. like, what could be more virtuous practice than looking after a loved one who's in a vulnerable state? Right. That is practice, right? But it's taking you away from your practice. It's <laughs> <laughs> your practice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Thank you. There's one Geshe in um, in Australia, Geshe Punso Sultram, who um, he only did his first level Geshe degree, not his highest Larumpa Geshe degree, because during the years where he was supposed to be finalizing that degree, he was looking after his teacher while his teacher was dying. Mm -hmm. And he, um, you know, he had to change his diaper. He had to feed him by hand. Like he had to clean everything, everything while his teacher was dying. And Geshe is just the kindest like his heart is just huge it's just as big as all outdoors 
you know, yeah. but he didn't finish his Larumba Geshe degree, you know, so he lacks a tiny bit of precision with this or that philosophical point, but he's like really, really deeply kind. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, if you have to pick one, I think I know which one I'd pick. You know, and yeah, it's it's somehow remembering that everything can be practice if you decide to make it so. And that the main practice is your internal narrative how you're speaking to yourself in your head and how you're speaking about yourself and about other people in your mind is your main practice. And it's not like I switch into practice onto the cushion and I switch out of practice off the cushion and there are unrelated events. I mean, you all know this, but really it's, it's interesting to see how lots of Dharma students put so much pressure on themselves for a certain type of form for practice, that they almost start to resent practice and get grumpier than they started. Yeah, was- I do so. Yes, yes, I. <laughs> and it, it, it sometimes I'm watching my daughter who's going through taking care of herself and her very ill son, and um, it's just really hard to watch because you feel guilty. You can't what you can't do or you want to do or you and. Um, She's feeling like she's she's overwhelmed, but she can't do it all. And it makes you wonder what you're supposed to be doing. It's just like, I've got time to do more than I do. And I'm thinking like, but I don't feel up to it. And I feel guilty about it. And I'm feeling like, oh, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. It's very judgmental. And I'm wondering about, particularly since we started to unite the earlier teachings where they are more centered on self like Zen and centered more on self than on Mayana because I have trouble going to I've been to groups where they were Zen and they wanted to do it I said well this is I'm doing this just for me and I'm thinking like well I don't understand that I don't understand that and um so it's it's hard I guess I if there's a there's a fine line is how to figure out how you take care of yourself, do enough practice, and take care of someone else or other people. I'm not, that's really difficult. I mean, it's it's huge. It's the heart of it, right? It's the heart of getting the right pace is exactly what you're saying. And it, it's really like realizing, self-cherishing, the thought that holds you of primary importance and primary focus at the expense of others or with indifference to others will also say, I don't have to take care of myself in the best way because it's only me. Yeah. If you don't have self-cherishing, if you're cherishing others, you prioritize your health because you know from a very healthy place, you're the best benefit to others. So it's, it's like by focusing on them, you actually look after yourself better. Because you say, if I don't eat properly, if I don't sleep enough, if I am run ragged and I have no downtime, I will build a type of resentment towards the very things I love to do and the very people I love. And that, you know, for their sake, I need to have a certain amount of downtime is time I have to have. Like, it's not free time that's like available to others. Downtime is also part of you nourishing your own practice for that sake. So you could become very, very busy putting out spot fires and helping with tiny tasks and be busy all day long helping. Or you could be busy helping in that direct way, just a short period, but deeply. Yeah. You know, in a a way that's very intentional and is offering something only you can offer as opposed to any number of people could help with these logistics and tasks, but only you can ha- kind of bring a type of presence she needs from her mother. You know, yeah. and maybe you're doing that while folding the laundry or chopping some vegetables, but what you're really thinking, I'm offering presence right now because right now what she needs is presence. You know, yeah. my presence, who knows her history, who knows how she is, who can support what's positive and gently show her what's not working. You know, all of those things that you have to offer from so many years of relationship, that is the kind gift of your practice. So you will ruin the kind gift of your presence if you do tons of miscellaneous tiny spot fires. So I guess just reassuring yourself that your wisdom has been telling you these things already 
And then the way we're socialized says, no, you have to be busier than this to be worthy of existence. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's nonsense. And it takes so long to just get ourselves out of it. And to notice it with some sort of like humor and be like, ah, bloody capitalism, ah, bloody, you know, Judeo-Christian upbringing, you know, and just kind of like laugh it off as that was never the point or the intention, but here it is right built into my bones. Productivity equals worth. What nonsense, but it's there and it will continue to be there. And I have to continue to gently confront it with some kind of space and say, people need me to be deeply present. They don't need me to be busy. How do you do, how do you compare that to goal being goal related? Is goal related what you're talking about? Well, it's like goal related in the big goal. Like the purpose of my life is to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, which may happen this life or in 20 lives or in 20 eons, but that's the direction I want to move in. And some days that direction is very clear and precise and has a lot of energy. And some days it's kind of foggy and distracted. But if I just keep coming back to that direction, the tasks of the day get the correct coloring. And if I forget that's the direction, then the tasks of the day are just tasks and almost can be a waste of time, even if I accomplished something they wind up being actually an obstacle to my path because I just treated them like a checklist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Jordan. You're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to kind of what you already said, but just said in a different way, you know, I always remember if I want to help others, oh, so we often have this kind of distorted view of selflessness like oh and self like i have to be selfless i have to give and give and give but in order to really be selfless first we have to have a strong sense of self which includes you know taking care of ourselves in order to benefit others um and <clears throat> just in the last week you know my dad's in hospice and uh um, I was sick for several days and a few times I was like, oh, I really should go see my dad, but, you know, I don't have the energy and just had to, and also I might get him sick too. And I just had to let it go. And, and it was, it was hard, but, um, you know, sometimes you just have to think things through and think, okay, what's the wise course of action, not to feel guilty that doesn't help anything here. I just, um, if I can help, then I'll help. But um, if I'm not in a position to help, I need to rest, get my energy back, and uh, just keep going in the best way I know how in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, exactly that. And just, you know, keep coming back to a kind inner conversation kind inner conversation and really like if you were your own best friend how would you speak to yourself you know we wouldn't ne be nearly so harsh if we were talking to our friends about in, in the way that we talk to ourselves we would adjust it immediately you know if our friend said oh I was going to do some meditation practice today but I was actually really tired and I just needed to make sure I cooked a healthy meal and had a rest you would say well of course but you say it to yourself and you're like, you should be able to do it both. You should be able to do it all. And if you can't, there's something wrong with you. Cause on a good day, you can whip, 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 you know? And it's like, <laughs> be nice to yourself, my goodness. You know, and the bloody form aggregate, right? Our bodies just crap out, they do. And, you know, I, I, I don't have the same age as you guys but I have chronic illness and I know I know what it is to, anticipate having more energy than I have and being disappointed that I don't and what it means to recalibrate what practice looks like based on my body not cooperating you know and just kind of having a little bit of a gentleness that is also a little bit like real humility not like the laziness of despondency but real humility that says Yes, my mind does work very fast, but my body does not often have the space to keep up. 
<laughs> so sometimes I have to let the body lead. Yeah, and it's it's a little humbling, but actually making peace with, with that has made me a lot more gentle. And, you know, and before making some peace with that, there was a kind of a, a defensiveness or a resentfulness or just a, like a tightness that I did not like seeing in my mind. You know, and it's not like it can't still pop up, but that's the project, right? That's the thought project right now is keep it gentle, <laughs> you know, and orienting your thoughts that way. Like, what is my thought project right now? Here's all the tons of teachings I've ever heard, but what I'm actually working on in my mind right now is joyous effort <laughs> or patience. You know, it's just one simple thing that's your thought project. Okay, well, thank you guys so much. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, dedicate unless you have any um, miscellaneous questions. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your, your practice with us. It really, it's very, very helpful. Well, you're very, you're very welcome. Thanks for asking um, me to come talk to you guys. It's been a nice group to connect with. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jordan. Due to this merit, may mm -hmm. we soon mm -hmm. attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all mm -hmm. sentient mm -hmm. beings from their sufferings. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. In the snowy mountain paradise, you're the source of good and happiness. Powerful Tenzin Gyatso Chenrezig. May you stay until samsara ends. Embodiment of the three divine refuges who blesses all, Gindan Tenzin, holder of the teachings. May your life spend last for an eternity. May your excellent deeds pervade all of time and space and continuously ripen for the nourishment of myself and all others. Great. Thank you so much, Venerable Young Ten. Um, hope you can come back and uh, teach us again.